Welcome to Unit 4, which is Movies About Childhood and Children. And the readings I picked were two chapters from a book by Norvin Richards. Uh, um, the book is called The Ethics of Parenthood. And the chapters are Abuse, Neglect and the State, uh, for which the movies that are particularly relevant would be, um, well, the documentaries, I would think, obviously. Uh, both of them are about uh, homeless kids. And um, also The Kid with a Bike, which is part of the reason why I strongly recommend you watch it, apart from the fact that it's a wonderful movie. And The Florida Project uh, is another one. And I guess The 400 Blows is also relevant. Um, yeah, and uh, Cass, I bet, uh, would be uh, would be a good one as well. Um, so let's get started with. Oh, that that's uh, one of the chapters is abuse, neglect, and estate. We'll do that first, uh, and then there's a chapter on autonomy of children, and we'll talk about that when we get there. So let's start with abuse, neglect, and the state. The first topic that uh, Richards takes up is neglect and uh, illustrates an example or provides an example that our theory of neglect must be tested against in the form of the horrific story of Sharice Iverson, whose father Leroy uh, took her along when he went to play the slots, and uh, while his attention was on his gambling, she was abducted or lured into the bathrooms and assaulted and murdered. Um, a horrible story, and it was in the news. Uh, I remember coming across it in the news because the other young man involved, who didn't actually do the killing but was a friend of the killer, uh, went to a school in California, it might have been Berkeley, um, and people found out that he was the other kid, and the, the students on campus protested his presence on campus, uh, but he had a right to be there because he hadn't done anything illegal. All right, so, Sharice Iverson gets murdered, obviously not by Leroy, but did what Leroy did in ignoring his kid, letting her run uh, wild in the casino while he plays the slots counts as neglect. Um, oh, let me say a little bit about the writing style of Norvin Richards. Um, I found it a little bit annoying. He His sentences tend to ramble on a little. And he tends to do something which, if you're not familiar with philosophy, can be uh, disconcerting and frustrating, which is that he sort of tries out an idea, floats an idea, then says, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And then ends up uh, deciding that maybe that idea should be rejected. So people who, who just read a, a piece of writing and say, OK, he said it. It's his view. I can write that down. That's his view. Now let's move on to the next point. We'll find themselves discovering, wait a minute, I thought that was his view and now he's criticizing it. Uh, if you're used to reading philosophy, this won't be uncommon to you, but he perhaps doesn't signpost it as well as he should. Um, there are virtues to his writing style. It's, uh, it's not technical at all. I mean, a few terms might be a little bit technical, like autonomy, but he gives definitions of them. So it should be readable to people who are not used to philosophy. And he doesn't c endlessly cite other philosophers. In fact, he, he hardly does that at all. So in that respect, it's good. But uh, as I said, it can be it's, it can be hard to stay with him as he follows a thread through a line of thinking. So I'll, I'll try and do the best I can to clarify it. All right, so starting with the issue of neglect. What counts as neglect? Uh, and furthermore, what counts as neglect to the extent that the state should step in? And of course, as he makes clear, 
we want to set a bar fairly high. We don't want an intrusive police state. We don't want a state whereby if, you know, you talk sharply to your kid because you're trying to concentrate while you're driving the car and he's fighting with his baby sister uh, and you yell at them, you don't want that to be an instance where the state steps in and removes your child. There should definitely be leeway. Uh, he wants to include you know, corporal punishment, uh, that spanking shouldn't be uh, a reason to take someone away. And I think the majority of people would probably be in agreement with that, although views are changing. And I think the less tolerant we are of corporal punishment, the better we are as a society. It's illegal in Scotland, uh, for example, spanking your child. Um, anyway. What counts as neglect? Well, on page 85, he introduces a standard for negligence uh, that emerges from tort law. Uh, and this is uh, attributed to Judge Learned Hand, which is the best name for a judge ever. This is an actual Supreme Court judge who existed. His name was Learned Hand. Um, and he suggested that there is negligence, uh, and this is in tort law. So this is negligence to the extent that someone is entitled to sue. Uh, so this is not immediately relevant to the issue of neglect in, in child care, because that's not a, an issue of suing and, and tort law. But anyway, this is just sort of as a starter. The idea was it was this little formula B, uh, if B is less than PL. So if the burden of the precautions is actually less than the probable loss by accidents, then you have been negligent apply that to the Iverson case and it looks like uh, the burden of precautions might have been, you know, find a sitter for your kids or maybe don't gamble tonight if you've got your kids. That's not much of a burden given that the... Now, you might say what well, the, there wasn't a very high probability of loss. It was just a huge misfortune that this psychotic murderer uh, happened to be in the casino at the time. But I think that has an unduly optimistic view of uh, how many, you know, abusers there are around. And uh, also, as uh, Richards points out, you know, it's, it's m after midnight in a casino that isn't designed for children. So, you know, pull it together, buddy. Um, so, uh, how should we use this standard uh, and apply it to the case at hand, which is uh, w uh, neglect rather than negligence. Well, Richard said we should have a stricter standard um, for children. That is, it shouldn't just be uh, the priorities the parent actually has. It should be the priorities the parent ought to have. Um, that is, uh, we shouldn't just say um, you know, we shouldn't just act as if it's asking a lot of somebody to take precautions. We, they should actually take precautions. So, uh, if anything, uh, you are more likely to be guilty of neglect by the adjusted standard than you would be of negligence. Now, uh, he considers objections that this is hard to tell. You know, what's the probable loss? Uh, you know, sometimes how can you predict what the probable loss is? And he said, but we do compare with cases of reckless endangerment. And he gives the example of spinning a loaded revolver around your finger to impress people at a party. If it goes off, you know, that's on you. You are guilty of re reckless endangerment. And even if it doesn't, you're guilty of reckless endangerment. Uh, a complicating factor, though, is the privacy right. Um, that is, parents do have a certain leeway in raising their children. Uh, you shouldn't intervene for every parental failure. Every parent is going to fail. Your parent, your kids will fall over. I mean, I remember when my kid was very young, he was in a crib and we heard an almighty thump and ran upstairs and he'd managed to flip himself out of this crib when, you know, the bar came up to here. How, how the hell he did that, I have no idea. Uh, but he did, and he could have broken his neck. Um, so should he have been taken away from us? Well, I'm going to say he shouldn't. Uh, and that's an instance of parental failure that, you know, is within, we took precautions, and yet we failed. 
every parent does that and it shouldn't be the case that the state steps in. Um, he summarizes with what you might think some of the conclusions that Richards ends up with, you might think, well, duh, we had to go through all that to arrive at something that seems fairly obvious. But what you've got to consider is the views that he rejects. So his view is going to be slightly different from other common views, and he's going to argue that his view is superior. Uh, well, anyway, at the end of the section on neglect, he says, neglect is to leave a child at an uh, unacceptable risk of harm. And later on, when he brings up the second young man in the Iverson case, he says, sometimes this is even true from, for a stranger. It's just that the unacceptable risk of harm will be different. What's an unacceptable risk of harm for, you, for your kid uh, is going to be much lower than the unacceptable risk of harm for somebody else. So, for example, the second young man who didn't intervene, he saw what was happening. He saw his friend basically about to kill uh, Sharice Iverson and he just turned around and walked away and said later, I didn't want to shop him, he was my friend, I didn't want to set the guards on him. Um, now technically as law stand that's not illegal, but you know, we might want to say that it should be. And that seems to be neglect. Still, the, the standard of neglect that Richards comes up with, neglect is to leave a child at unacceptable risk of harm. Alright, what about abuse? Uh, he begins the discussion of abuse by saying there are three purposes in treating what a parent has done as abuse, in sort of labeling it and, and the state coming in and saying you are abusing your child. The first one is to help the child heal. That is to let the child know this was unacceptable. You don't have to suffer this. This is not normal. Uh, the fact that you don't like this, the fact that you feel miserable is totally understandable. That's okay. You shouldn't feel guilty. Or you shouldn't feel like this is what I deserve. This is normal. Two, to project, to protect the child from more of the same. That is another reason to label that as abuse. And three, to deal appropriately, either punishment or therapy, with the abuser. Now, the third one is different from the first two because the first two are to do with protecting the child, and the the uh, third one is to do with dealing with the adult. And if they come into conflict, that is, if the, if for example we decide that it would be the best therapy for the adult if they were still allowed access to their child, even if this puts their child at risk, well, what Richard says, and I think most people would agree, the needs of the child comes first. So even if it's it's hurtful to the parent to have their child taken away. Um, the needs of the child comes first. Uh, you might apply this to the case of Mooney in uh, the Florida Project. Um, and you'll understand what I mean if you watch the movie. Okay. Um, now, a thread running through this chapter is that uh, Richards makes a distinction between there are two kinds of obligations an adult can have to a child, a parent can have to a child. There's obligations that even strangers have to a child. Uh, and then there's obligations that are specific to the parent. For example, later on, uh, the, an example of the second type is the parents have a much stronger obligation to raise the child. Strangers don't really have that. Although strangers, uh, as he says, see, the thing about Richards is he admits that life is complicated. He doesn't make this a simple black and white issue. And he says, well, yes, we say that only parents have a, a, a duty to raise the child, but there is a sense in which even strangers do. For example, if I saw a strange kid torturing an animal, I should step in and say, hey, that's not right. That's sort of helping to raise the kid. But uh, there's a, obviously a much stronger duty that a parent has to uh, raise their child. Okay, so uh, dealing with the first kind of obligations First, that is obligations that even strangers have. Um, he brings up Joel Feinberg, who's a, a famous um, philosopher, was at the University of Arizona, wrote a lot on um, harm, on sort of uh, the law, the law and issues of harm. Feinberg's examples of crimes in every civilized country. 
willful homicide, forcible rape, aggravated assault, and battery. If we commit one of those to a child, uh, we are failing in even the duties that a stranger would have to a child, obviously. Whereas, you know, not feeding a child, that doesn't mean we violated an, ish, uh, uh, an obligation that a stranger would have to that child because a stranger, it's not the stranger's job to feed the child. Provided, you know, the child isn't starving, then maybe if you see a child in the street, you do. But that's another, uh, you, you get the basic idea. There are a sort of things so bad that even a stranger shouldn't do them. And then there's uh, things that you can fail in doing without failing in the obligations that a stranger has to a child. But uh, you would fail if you were their parent. Okay, his, his suggestion is that uh, a parent is abusing the child. Um, this, uh, I'll quote what he says on page 91. Insofar as our interest in protecting her, the child, is concerned, what matters is that uh, what the behavior of the parent strongly indicates about him, since that is what should be expected to be in play in his future treatment of her. All right. Um, what Richard suggests is, in working out whether or not a parent is abusing the child, uh, perhaps an obvious idea is to uh, is to ask is is the parent doing something seriously wrong to the child now that's obvious and makes common sense but richard says actually that's not as good as his suggestion which is um we look at what he has done to uh, he being the parent she being the child in this instance we look at what the parent has done to the child and ask what does that behavior indicate about the parent? And if it indicates a serious failure of concern in the parent, then we should label it as abuse and then the parent state should step in. So it's not just that it's bad, it's what it indicates. Because, for example, he's going to later give an example of something that seems like really bad that a parent would have done. and. Uh, one example he talks about is an Aboriginal, an Australian Aboriginal parent putting a spear through the thigh of his daughter. Now, we would say that's seriously wrong, but it wouldn't necessarily indicate a lack of concern once you understand features of the culture of uh, certain Aboriginal groups. Um, so, in other words, what we've got to focus on is uh, does the behavior that you know f caused a red flag to go up and, and someone to report possible abuse to the state. Does that behavior indicate a, uh, a failure that the parent is defective in concern? Actually, there are, there are uh, three, three things that if we decide they're true, they warrant removal of the child. One, that the parent is defective concern, in concern, or, or two, that the parent, although perhaps has concern, lacks the ability to implement it, perhaps because they're given to uncontrollable rages, even though they love their kid. Or three, they have a condition, perhaps addiction, that prevents them um, implementing their concern. If any of those is true, then we should flag it as abuse and we should move in. Now he considers objections to this view. And this is section three, starting on page 93. Okay, first objection. Uh, it's very accusatory, calling parents defective. Uh, you're saying, so you're saying that if we label it as abuse, we're saying the parent is defective, defective in concern. Um, response, the response is, I don't really care. It's the effect, the results of what matter. I don't have to call you defective. I could say you are acting as if you're a defective. I'm not calling you a liar. It's like, you know, arguments you've had. No, I'm not calling you a liar. I'm just saying that you're lying. Um, you're doing something that is the same as if someone who lacked a concern would do. And that's bad enough. Um, the point is to take care of the child. Uh, second objection to this idea. Well, uh, oh, because um, uh, something else that Richard says is, uh, okay, the standard is it's abuse 
if it shows a serious uh, defect in concern. And he also says a clear indication of this or a, a very uh, a red flag for this is if the parent falls below the obligations that even a stranger would give. So for example, even a stranger is not supposed to rape a child. So if a parent rapes a child, this is Richard's example, then they're falling below even the standards that a stranger, never mind what a, a parent should do, they're falling below the standards that even a stranger should do. And that's an indication of consent. Now the objection is, well, but sometimes you can act in a way to your child as, it, as its parent in a way that a stranger would not be allowed to do. So for example, uh, spanking, if you believe in spanking, you probably believe you have the right to do it, but you don't believe that a stranger can haul off and hit your kid. Uh, so if you hit your kid, that's uh, they're doing something that a stranger would not be allowed to do, but it shouldn't be labeled to abuse because as a parent, you're actually allowed to act like that. That's the objection. Um, he says, yes, all right. Uh, oh, no, and to illustrate this objection. So this is still an objection and he's giving a case to flesh it out. The example of John and Sarah on page 94 who are opposed to violent play and restrict and, and monitor their kids very strongly to make sure that they don't indulge in play that is violent. I remember my parents wouldn't let me read war comics. When I was growing up in a uh, very long time ago in, in England, uh, war comics were very popular. They were all about World War II, which for some reason was still fresh on people's minds, even though it was decades before. Um, and, you know, they demonized the Germans and stuff like that. So my parents disapproved of them. So I, I hid them as if I was hiding pornography. You know, I had the, this stash of comics about war that I, uh, I hid in the attic. Um, I told them about this years later. So they, they, had, they were trying to do this in a kind of half-hearted way and I managed to got, get around it. However, John and Sarah like monitor their, their helicopter parents. They monitor their kids. Is that okay? Well, we might, we might say, those are helicopter parents, they're going too far. But would we set the state on them? Should this be something that would count as abuse? No. It just means uh, we don't think that we should parent like that, but it's within the acceptable range. However, if John and Sarah behave like that to other people's kids, then that, that crosses the boundary. You can't do that to my kid. You're allowed to do it to your kid, but you're not allowed to do it to my kid. So it seems to be an example of this kind of behavior where, so the objection goes, acting in a way that a stranger is not allowed to do shouldn't be necessarily a sign of, um, uh, of abuse. What does Richard say in response to this criticism? He says, I never really... I never said that it counted as abuse. I said that it was a good red flag. He says, look, what my standard is, is uh, abuse is actually if the parent doesn't care to the level required by pa for parental obligations, doesn't know how to act on the concern, or has condition presenting the result. Those are the three things we've already listed. Those are the true things. So falling below the standard of a stranger is just a rule of thumb. It's not going to be, he's not saying that that's every time that happens, that's abuse. He's saying that's a good sign, makes it worth investigating. But he never said that that's what constitutes abuse. Uh, now, we might ask, but why isn't what John and Sarah do grounds for state intervention? And his answer is uh, that they're actually fulfilling a parental obligation. This is on page 95. There is a parental obligation to provide a moral education, and this is what they're doing. We might not like how they do it, but this is, they're certainly attempting to fulfill a moral obligation. Okay, third objection to Richards's view. Richards's view, again, is abuse uh, is indicated by being defective in concern. Uh, the objection, third objection is, his view presupposes a false dilemma that people are either like parents or they're like strangers because he's talked about duties that a parent specifically has and duties that even a stranger has. But of course there is at least a, a third group which are professionals uh, whose job it is to care for children who are not quite like 
strangers and they're not parents. These would be, include doctors, teachers, camp counselors, nannies, those kind of people. Their job is to care for children who aren't their kids. Um, what Richard says about them is that uh, actually what he says is, look, parents have a greater duty than anybody else. Call them strangers, but we can lump these people in with them. And in fact, these people, these professional caregivers, actually have the same duties as strangers do. It's just that they're in a position to know more. So even a stranger, like the second young man in the Iverson case, if he knows that a kid is being abused, he should uh, save her. Uh, this kid should have saved Sharice Iverson from his friend. Um, obviously, doctors are more likely to be in a position to know that kids are being abused. They, uh, you know, you hear stories all the time about doctors uh, looking at kids and seeing that they are covered in bruises and realizing that this must be, this must be abuse. So, again, another story from my childhood. Uh, I have a scar here and a scar here. Uh, and they're from accidents I had a week apart when I was about six. Um, I can't remember which one came first. I think this one came first. This one, I fell out of an attic and there was a, an old-fashioned metal radiator underneath because uh, there, there was an attic hatch and I wasn't looking and I fell through and hit my chin on a radiator and bust my chin open and there was blood everywhere and so they stitched that up for free. National Health Service, great thing. Um, and then a week later, I was in the back seat of our car, which was a thing called a Morris Minor, which looked like a more old fashioned Volkswagen Beetle. And we turned around a corner and there was a car coming the other way. My mom slammed on the brakes and this car had a weird system where the seats, instead of the seats going up like this, the seats folded in the middle. Um, so the seat folded in the middle, I hurtled forward and I banged my head on the, the dashboard and it bust open and there was blood everywhere. So they rushed me to the hospital. And as they were stitching up this, my forehead, they noticed there was stitches still in here. And they, my, both my parents said they gave the, my parents a really long, hard searching look because they were thought, clearly these parents are slapping the shit out of this kid. But now it was just that uh, two unfortunate things happened within a week. Um, yeah, so that's an instance of, of why uh, you know, did the doctors have a greater duty to care for me than a stranger would? No. It's just that they're more likely to be aware of uh, cases of abuse because of their job. Same with a nanny. They're with a kid more often. They're more likely to see that. But they don't actually have a greater duty. All right. Page 98. Summary of the discussion of abuse. A, s a state should protect kids from adults who are seriously defective in concern, that's his first and main point, Two parents give it a good indication of being defective in concern if they treat kids worse than strangers would, with the proviso that this is not always the case, as we've seen. Now, a contrasting view to this is that a state should intervene simply when the parent has done something very bad. Uh, and Richard says his view is superior because in focusing on what the act signifies, you know, in focusing on does this act indicate something beyond it, like that the parent is uh, lacking in concern, it takes us beyond the individual act. And the thing about abuse and neglect is they have to be ongoing. The reason why my parents weren't actually abusing and neglecting me, uh, it, even though I had you know stitches in my forehead and chin, is because these were kind of one-offs. However, if this had really kept going, you know, if my mom hadn't learned from this lesson and said, okay, you're not traveling in the back seat before or, or at least sit behind me. So if we stop suddenly, you, you know, you're not going to fly forward with the passenger seat folding because there were no such things as seat belts in the back then. <laughs> Kids nowadays. Um, you know, if my, my mother had not learned from this, then it would, would have seen like, if it had been an ongoing thing and she said, ah, you'll be fine, then it would have been neglect or at least more like it. Um, so one-offs are not necessarily indicators of abuse or neglect. It has to be a tendency, and that's what um, Richard's view incorporates something, incorporates. It's if we learn that the parent doesn't care, 
then it's abuse and neglect. Bad things can happen to anyone. Um, it has to be an ongoing tendency for it to be abuse and neglect. All right. Uh, and the other thing about um, simply going by bad uh, things happening to the kid is it could just be an indicator of different values. And this is where the case of the Aboriginal father uh, on page 99 comes up. Why did this father do something so horrific to his daughter as poke her, her thigh with a spear? The answer is because in their culture, that was what you do when she'd, she'd be, she was present at the death of an elder and this was something that was so wrong that it required this kind of response. Another example is Jehovah's Witnesses or Christian scientists uh, are violently opposed to blood transfusions. Um, they believe that it will destroy your chance at heaven. And obviously your eternal life is much more important than your life on earth. So they will not give their kids blood transfusions even if it causes their death. Uh, a movie that I've just become aware of um, I don't think I would have included it anyway because most of the movies I wanted you to watch were about younger children but uh, it's a movie that you can watch for free if you have Amazon Prime it's called The Children Act and it's a very recent movie and it stars Emma Thompson it's based on a book by the well-known British novelist Ian McEwan who wrote Atonement among other things um, and the plot is that a 17 year old uh, I think he's a Jehovah's Witness, will die if uh, he doesn't get a blood transfusion and he refuses to get one because he's a devout uh, Jehovah's Witness. And Emma Thompson is the judge who has to decide, can he be forced to have one? And now this is an example of something that is also relevant to the next chapter on autonomy. Anyway, check it out if you've got the time. Um, I... I I think this is a movie that's kind of drier and it's more like a movie that is exploring an idea and the characters in it are just there to further the idea. Whereas what I like about the movies that I chose is that the children are real children and it's not, they're not just, uh, they're not just ciphers to uh, explore an idea. It, they're just, you know, they're real kids or at least uh, they, they certainly seem more real. But anyway, check it out if you want, the Children Act. Um, okay, so in the case of the Aboriginal father and the Jehovah's Witness, the parents really do have concern. So this is these are both cases where uh, there's a parting of the ways about whether or not abuse or neglect has happened between Richard's, I, Richard's view, which says, you know, abuse or neglect has happened when there's a defect in concern, well, it seems like he would have to say, in this case, abuse hasn't happened. Whereas the view that just says abuse or neglect has happened if something bad has happened to the kid, is going to say, hell, hell, this kid will die in the Jehovah's Witness case. Or, you know, this kid got a spear through her thigh. Those are pretty bad. That's abuse or neglect. As Richard says, um, you know, we have to take seriously the values of others. And another case that he doesn't mention that I think is relevant here is FGM, female genital mutilation. It is a cultural practice in some cultures, particularly from some parts of Africa, where they uh, operate on a, a girl's uh, vagina, or uh, usually clitorectomy, removal of the clitoris, but it can be as extreme as stitching up the vagina. You probably know about this, you can research it. Um, why do they do it? It's a cultural thing. And in, in some cases, it's mothers who've had the practice done to them insist that their daughters should have it too. Uh, is that abuse or neglect? What do we say? Uh, the, the reason they want their kids to have it is so that they are a part of the community. Otherwise, they are committing a, a serious offense and that's a bad thing. So it seems like they have concern for their child in wanting to uh, do female genital mutilation. But on the other hand, uh, certainly most cultures in the West would say, hell no, you're not doing that here. And in fact, it is illegal in, for example, I know it's illegal in Britain, even though of course it happens. And I think it's illegal in the United States too. Um, 
does Richard's view not allow for a, a state to call that abuse? And he says, no, but you have to supplement my view with the other point, that is, um, when you're an adult, you're free to rank your, your values, your moral values, over your own safety, but you're not free to do that for your child. Uh, and he gives the example on page 100, it's like being a hero. You're free to choose to be a hero, but you can't make your kid be a hero. You can jump into a bull ring, but you can't throw your kid into a bull ring. So, the case of the Aboriginal father and the Jehovah's Witness, uh, the state has an interest in protecting that child, and the parents do not have a right to privilege their values over the safety of the child, at least so he suggests. State may also protect children from parents whose values put uh, them at a serious risk. All right, section five goes on to obligations that only parents have. So far we've looked at obligations that even strangers would have. Now we're looking at obligations only parents would have. There are distinctively parental obligations uh, two main classes. One, looking after the child's current welfare. I don't have to do that with strangers. Uh, I think I should have to pay taxes so that there is a social safety net, but I should. I don't have to literally focus on the uh, the welfare of strangers, strange children. And two, uh, parents have to attend to what the child will become. Uh, this is sort of a duty to raise the child. They have to, as, he, as Richards put it, provide resources of character. I have to ensure that my child acquires, for example, a sense of self-worth, uh, empathy for others, honesty. And if a child lacks these uh, to a great degree, then the parent has failed. Um, now, you might wonder, there's a movie that I will never watch called, uh, oh, what is it? Something about Kevin. What should we do about Kevin or... Uh, have you heard what they're saying about Kevin or something starring Tilda Swinton uh, where uh, actually there's there's a few like this uh, where it turns out the child turns into like a school shooter um, is that a failing of parenthood well when you look at cases of parents whose children turn into school shooters a lot of the time they say I did all I could I have other children who didn't turn into school shooters this one there was just something missing with this child. So uh, you would have to weigh that. But anyway, in most cases, it's your duty to ensure that your par your kid has empathy, has a moral, good moral sense. That's part of an obligation that a parent has. It's a specifically parental obligation. It's not an obligation that uh, uh, strangers should have. All right, section six on page 104 asks what form a state's response should take if they decide that abuse or neglect has happened. Um, okay, he says, Richard says it differs depending on whether or not uh, the parent has failed in the obligations that are specific to a parent. If that is the case, then the state should investigate leave the kid with the parent perhaps or or at least favor that as an option but investigate further to see if there's a defect in consent whereas if the parent has failed in the obligation that even as a stranger has so in other words if the par parent has for example raped their child then you immediately remove so there's a different response depending on whether or not the parent has failed in an obligation that even a stranger would have immediate removal uh, or failed in obligations specific to parents investigate try and change the behavior of the parent question page 106 what about parents rights to raise their kids their way so suppose you decide hey you're failing in your parental obligations the the parent responds i'm raising my kid my way uh don't you tell me how to raise my kid and you can see that this would be the response that parents have um, I know in my extended family, uh, you know, there are parents that you look at and say that's terrible, but they, they, fight, they would fight like a tiger to maintain control over the kid. Uh, 
again, the Florida project is a good example. Um, what Richard says in response to this is he says, look, if somebody abandons the family, and this is where a kid with a bike uh, is relevant, that the movie the, a kid with a, the Kid with a Bike, if someone abandons their family, they lose parental rights. So you don't no longer have you can no longer say I have the right to raise my kid the way I want. No, you left. Your right is over. Uh, and he says, OK, we all agree on that. But second move, if you um, indicate a serious defect in concern, remember his standard for abuse, uh, it's as if you have abandoned. So you no longer have your rights. So if you do something bad enough, you can't say, hey, I have the right to raise my kid in my way. Um, you've lost it. Now, I think the Florida Project is a good standard of this, uh, a good case for this, because in order to pay the rent, uh, Mooney's mother, Haley, resorts to a kind of behavior that is illegal. And this is part of the reason that Child Protective Services come in. Um, she's kind of in, in a corner though and she clearly loves Mooney and Mooney does Mooney come to any harm she's going to press this argument what you might ask yourself is is Richard's is Richard's argument that she has abandoned she hasn't in effect abandoned Mooney uh, does that hold water um Next question, another question on page 107. Isn't it in the child's best interest to be reunited with the family? And also the family is a valuable institution. Don't we, doesn't the state have a duty to keep families intact? Uh, the quote on page 108, Richard says to this, the arguments in favor of reassembling the families are weakest when what we fear for the child is the worst. So it kind of depends. If, um, you know, maybe this person you know, this, this person doesn't read to their kid at bedtime. That's not serious enough to uh, warrant keeping the child away or giving the child to a foster home. Even though, suppose there's a foster home where this child would be lavished with love, would get a much better upbringing. upbringing. Uh, it's still not enough to warrant removal of the child from the family. You can't just... So in other words, because you want to be careful. Otherwise, any rich parent, any rich person could say, hey, I can give that child a better life. So I want that child and take it from any poor parent, a poor single mother who's living on welfare and, you know, sometimes has to leave the kid alone because she has to work. Um, a rich parent can come and say, My, that, if that child was mine, they would never be alone. Should we be should we allow that as a society, or should we say that the family should be kept together uh, as a sort of first? Uh, that should be our first goal, or at least um, that should certainly be something we should we should do unless it's unavoidable. Richards would agree. He also says when if harm comes to a child because of different values rather than a defect in concern, then we should err on behalf of keeping the family together. So back to the Aboriginal family. Yes, it's a terrible thing if a kid has a spear through their thigh. Now, if the reason they got a spear through their thigh was just for kicks, the parents thought, hey, I like to see my, my kid cry. I'm going to poke her with this sharp stick, then absolutely remove that kid. Whereas if it didn't indicate a defect in concern, in fact, the reason why the parent did that is because they believe this is the way to save their soul or something, uh, then you should err on the side of keeping them in intact. And also there are further reasons not to break up a minority culture families because there's this long history of cultural genocide where, for example, children in Canada and the United States, children were taken away from Native American families precisely to so that they wouldn't grow up speaking Native American languages or having Native American religions as an attempt to destroy that culture. And that's an ugly history, and we want to err on the side of caution. All right. Uh, one nice thing that Richards does in both of the chapters that I have you read is uh, the last section sums up nicely. So if you want, 
read the last section first in both cases and then you will know what to expect. So section 7 on page 110 to 11, it summarizes that chapter nicely. It doesn't go into the arguments, of course, but it, it summarizes its main points. All right, that's the first article. Now, the second article, the second chapter, which is the very next chapter in his book, uh, is about the autonomy of children. Now, autonomy is a term, a slightly technical term. I mean, we do use it in everyday life, but philosophers have definitely offered more technical definitions of it. Um, the definition that he gives um, doesn't come up until section 4 on page 127. So he's going to say, autonomy is making one's own way through the world, putting one's own personality and character into action. If you've ever taken a medical ethics class, the issue of autonomy is, is a core issue in medical ethics. Um, doctors, uh, it comes up in issues of how honest should doctors be to their patients? Do uh, Should doctors tell their patients the truth? Uh, you know, if even if they think it'll be bad for the patient, you know, tell your patient. Should you tell your patient they have three weeks to live, or should you should should you let them be happy for three weeks? Because there's nothing they can do about it. And knowing that they're going to die is just going to uh, ruin the last three weeks. Um, people who favor autonomy say absolutely, you have got to tell them. You, if you do not treat people autonomously you're not respecting them as free agents. You're not, respect, you're not treating them as people capable of choosing for themselves. Now, of course, that's what we do to children. In fact, the, um, the alternative to auto, uh, autonomy or to treating people as autonomous is called paternalism, acting like a parent. Um, so, uh, and, it, of course, this is obviously bad if you do it to adults, or at least it's assumed so. You, uh, adults have the right to free choice, and if you're paternalistic to them. So, for example, libertarians say the government shouldn't be paternalistic. They're opposed to things like helmet laws. Because what is a helmet law? It's telling you you have to wear a helmet on a motorcycle for your own good. And what libertarians say is... It's up to me. I get to choose to I should be able to choose to do something stupid because I'm an autonomous agent. You de don't get to control my life. That's paternalism. All right. But even libertarians don't tend to argue for autonomy for for children because they say, well, obviously children are a special case. However, uh, one of the thing if you write the paper on this this chapter, I wanted you to read a short um, newspaper excerpt summarizing the view of uh, of a guy who is quoted um, in the section on uh, or at least referred to in the section on um, child, children's liberation uh, David Archard who writes uh, who's written a slew of books on the rights of children uh, Farson is the name of the, the guy. Farson wrote a book and was uh, a defender of the child's liberation movement, who he said who he said was like the logical next step. It's like gay liberation, women's liberation, uh, child's liberation. We should um, uh, the parallel with feminism was that this uh, up until the 19th century and early 20th century, women were presented as inherently weak not um, not as good choosers. This is why they weren't given the vote. They were not supposed to be capable of choosing rationally, um, you know, who should be in, in charge, so they shouldn't vote. Children still don't have the vote. But what Farson and others were saying is that that is also wrong, that children are capable of choice and um, should be given rights, the rights of adults. That's obviously an extreme view, because I doubt if even them were saying we should have... I mean, uh, you might not remember, but there was a TV show called Doogie Howser, M.D., uh, starring Neil Patrick Harris in, his, in an early role. And here is a, like a teenager who is a doctor who's operating on people, and that would never happen, and I don't want to happen, and you don't want it to happen. Um, but the child's liberation movement presumably might be in favor of them. Hey, 
nimble little fingers might be good at it. Um, anyway, uh, the child's liberation movement represents one extreme, which is that children should have the full autonomy of adults. The other extreme would be treating a 15, would be as in the example of the parents at the park that we'll come to, treating a 15 year old like a uh, like a three year old and not allowing her to do anything for herself. Somewhere in the middle of these two extremes lies the golden mean, wh what we should allow. And Norvin Richards wants to, to get to that. And the case of Amy Ling Hagen is a, a good case to begin with because uh, Amy Lynn Hagen wants to run off with James Campbell, has done it once before, and you know now she's on the run with this guy James Campbell, who has perhaps who is probably older than her and has been charged with statutory rape. Uh, should should she, who was 17 years old, like the kid in that movie I was talking about, the Children Act. Should she be allowed to? I mean, if she's 18 year old, nobody would doubt that she should. She's 17 year old, 17 years old, and the parents want her back. Shouldn't they let her go? I mean, what's the difference between 17 and 18? Isn't this an arbitrary line? Shouldn't she be given the right? Uh, the conventional view, Rich, uh, Richard said, which again isn't necessarily his view, is that a child's autonomy merits some respect, but not to the same degree as an adult as an adult's. That is, our children should be objects of paternalistic concern that would be intrusive and inappropriate if applied to an adult. Okay, section one, beginning on page 115, is um, arguments for and against the conventional view. Um, so, the argument for the conventional view is that the typical adolescent will make dangerous decisions. Therefore, it makes sense that we should be paternalistic. There's all these studies that show that teenagers are impulsive. They have poor sense. They have a poor sense of uh, long-term planning. They are more reckless. They will do riskier things. So their brains are basically different. Um, People argue that that's why they shouldn't be smoking marijuana, because their brains are not yet fully formed until in their early 20s even. So that's an argument that, therefore, we shouldn't allow them to choose. We should choose for them. But in response to this, uh, so sort of taking the children's liberation view, or perhaps the adolescent uh, liberation view, Lawrence Kohlberg, a famous uh, psychologist, had a theory of cognitive development, and he did studies on uh, uh, on various people at various ages, and he concluded that adolescents are at the same level of um, cognitive development as adults, which is level two or three. Um, and this is the level where you rely on the conventions of those around you, either so your larger society or of your peers. So. If the, um, if the adolescents are just as good or bad as uh, a large number of adults, and we would never consider preventing adults from choosing, uh, then, should, then this is not an argument we can use against, uh, or we can use for paternalism. Um, and this is a point that Richards continually presses. He says, look, Whenever somebody gives an argument in favor of paternalism towards children, we test that argument by saying, would it work on adults? And if it wouldn't give us a reason to be paternalistic to adults, then it shouldn't give us a reason to be paternalistic to children. We, won't, we're, we only find it convincing when applied to children because we already assume it's okay to be paternalistic to children. So as he says, it sort of begs the question. It's not, it's not an argument for paternalism it assumes paternalism. We only find it convincing because we believe we should be uh, paternalistic. If it really worked, then it would work on adults too. So we ask ourselves, suppose it turns out that adults are poor choosers. And I think most people are. Uh, I'm not going to bring up the last election. Um, we, uh, but nonetheless, the fact that they are poor choosers 
isn't enough to swear us. In fact, we think it's their right to make poor choices. So in that case, we should say the same about children. That we haven't found a reason to be paternalistic to children. All right, page 117, he says a separate, a, a new approach, a new attempt to argue why we should be paternalistic to children rather than adults. And he cites Samantha Brennan. And she says two things. Children's choices don't reflect their long-term preferences. She says children change their views. Their favorite color is purple. One day their favorite color is pink the next. Uh, and children, two children are still becoming good choosers. They're, they're forming the self that is capable of making choices. So our paternalism is to ensure that they do become good choosers. Uh, now, this sounds plausible, but again, Richards says, uh, suppose we tried that on adults. Suppose we, we said to an adult, you know, you're not actually a good chooser. You chose, uh, for example, in the last election, you voted for someone who doesn't really further your interests because they said things that uh, you found convincing that you shouldn't have. So therefore, we're not going to let you vote next time. That wouldn't wash. Uh, nobody would be convinced by that, so it shouldn't work for um, children. Third attempt to argue for a, a relevant difference between children and adults is Robert Noggle. Uh, he brings up the notion of temporally extended agency. The idea here is that, um, and he says temporally extended agency is necessary for being a member of the moral community. That is, you have to have a conception of yourself in the future uh, in order to be someone that we can trust. So, for example, suppose someone makes me a promise. Should I believe them? Only if they have a real sense of themselves in the future existing as someone with an obligation. If I have no sense that I exist any moment but the present, then I won't care about the future. I'll just say, hey, I'll say these words I promised to this guy and it'll get him off his back, but it doesn't incur any obligations to me because I only exist in the present. I don't exist in the future. You have to have a fairly sophisticated sense of yourself as a being that exists through time in order to be capable of morality. Um, and, says Robert Noggle, uh, children aren't like this. Well, says Richards on page 119, yeah, that's, that's true for young children. Young children really don't have a sense of themselves in anything but the now. They don't have a conception of what they'll be doing in the future uh, and plan for it. That's very young children. But, you know, fairly quickly they acquire it, and certainly an adolescent has it as much as an adult. So th that'll work for young children, but it doesn't justify paternalism to adolescents. All right, section two, um, we've got the contrast. Uh, the one extreme, the parents in the park uh, treating the 15-year-old like a three-year-old. We think that's abhorrent. Why? Because it's unfairly restricting the autonomy of the 15-year-old. On the other extreme, we've got the children's liberation movement described in, on page 120. That seems to go too far. Um, now, what Richard says he's going to do is he says, Let's try and start with the very young and see if we can justify paternalism for the very young and then maybe move on to the adolescents. Um, there's a suggestion that they're not yet choosers. So protecting them from harm is like cushioning an epileptic's head. An epileptic doesn't choose to damage his head when he's having a fit. So we're not being paternalistic to him if we cushion it. Nobody would say, oh, you can't be paternalistic to the epileptic, you know, let him let him bang his head. No, because you're not restricting his choice because he's not capable of choosing when he's having a fit. Maybe children are the same. They don't have the capacity to, to choose yet. So in preventing them from harming themselves, you're not actually uh, doing, you're not restricting their autonomy because they don't have any autonomy yet. Um, now, again, that would only work for very young children. And there, he, he considers, well, then maybe we shouldn't even call this paternalism because paternalism is restricting someone's autonomy. And if they don't have autonomy, then you're not being paternalistic. But putting that aside, um, 
this doesn't apply to adolescents. And also, uh, some paternalism doesn't involve harm. It involves, you know, we, we sort of uh, are paternalistic. We make our children do things not because they'll harm themselves otherwise, but because we think it'll be better for them. Like we make them go to the theater or something like that. Uh, it's not going to, you know, we're not saving them from harm. We're just doing it because we think they'll be better. Uh, section three, then. Um, in section three, starting on page 123, he asks why the defects, like the defect of concern that we were talking about in the earlier chapter, chapter four, are defects. Why is it that uh, having a lack of concern as, for example, being indifferent to your child, why is that a defect? And he says, well, the obvious answer is, if you're indifferent, for example, to your child, you won't have what it takes, what parenthood takes. One of the um, mysteries, here actually, uh, what he says on page 123 made me think of the kid with a bike. Uh, because one of the things you see in that movie is that Samantha, uh, the main adult in that movie, does amazing things for Cyril. And you ask yourself, well, why the hell is she doing this? And she she understands what it takes because Cyril doesn't say thank you. Cyril is uh, stubborn and pig headed, you know, and yet she takes this in us in it in her stride. Um, she isn't discouraged by rejection, as he mentions at the top of page 124. That's one of the things that a parent has to be able to do. You know, your kid will say, I hate you at some point and probably quite often if you burst into tears and said well fine then i di disavow you you can't be a parent you've got to be able to get past that so if you are indifferent you're not going to be able to be a parent so and, and the second point of this is affection for one's child is a requirement of parenthood to be a parent you have to have affection uh the quote on page 124 our paternalistic interest in our children is an aspect of the broader affection that we must have for them if we are to be good parents. So he's suggesting here that paternalism is just an aspect of affection. So that's why parents are allowed to do it, because unless they have affection that make, drives them to be paternalistic, then they can't be parents. So affection is behind paternalism. You don't need to ask permission to do things out of love. You do need to ask for permission to do things out of love for an adult. Um, it would be weird to do things out of love for a strange adult. You have to ask their permission. <coughs> you don't for a child. Um, now, consider, uh, here's another heartbreaking example. This chapter has a few of them. Uh, this these chapters. Jessica Dubroff, she comes up on page 125. A seven-year-old, her parents let her fly solo in an attempt to fly across the continental United States, and of course she goes into a storm, the plane crashes, she dies. How should we think about this? They say they were respecting her choice. It's what, uh, The mother said, we do it again, because she really wanted this, this was, this was, what she wanted. We would have destroyed her as a person if we'd prevented this. Um, he says, well, is the question we should ask, he's, now his intuition is that clearly the parents were wrong. Now, if you don't share that uh, intuition, then, you know, obviously you're going to disagree with them. But he says, look, obviously the parents shouldn't have let, let Jessica fly. But how can we uh, justify this intuition? How can we, what's the argument we, we give for that sh they shouldn't have let her fly? And he says, how about this? Should we ask, would things go better for, th is the, the question we should ask, would things go better for this person if we were to control what she did? Um, is that the question that the Dubrofs should have asked and failed to ask? He says, well, but again, remember, it's got to work for adults. 
and that question doesn't work for adults. You know, it's not enough, uh, you know, plenty of cases where it would work, something would work better for an adult if I, you know, if I, if I outlaw people getting tattoos on their faces, their life will go better. Can I outlaw people, adults putting tattoos on their faces? No, we regard that as an unjustifiable restriction of their autonomy to be stupid shits. That's part of what it is to be autonomous, is to make mistakes. Um, so what's an alternative suggestion? There are differences in understanding. Uh, but again, this doesn't really work. Uh, for example, what about an adult wanting to do what Jessica did? Suppose an adult says, I know I don't really know how to fly a plane, but I'll fly it in a deserted area. If I crash it, it's on me. I want to take this risk. Can we stop them? It w uh, most people would say that's unjustifiably paternalistic. So we still haven't come up with a reason why it is okay to be paternalistic to uh, young children. Well, in section four, he suggests the following, uh, starting on page 127. This is where finally he gives a definition of autonomy. He says, autonomy is making one's own way through the world, putting one's own personality and character into action. And here's where the argument is going to go. He's going to say, in the case of a young child like Jessica, it's not really her personality yet because she's too young to have made it her own. What you, she wants, we cannot know if that's really her or if it's uh, a trait that her parents have put in her. Now, he says, the obvious response to this is, well, we all acquire traits. I, you know, traits as adults, I have traits that I've, uh, I've acquired from my parents. Like, you know, my mom was an English teacher and certain grammatical, res uh, I, I cannot make an certain grammatical mistakes, otherwise I hate myself. Why do I have that trait? My mom put it in me. Did I choose it? Is it one that I created in myself? No, nobody is self-created in that way. We all acquire traits from, from others. So isn't this again a problem where we don't, we're not applying the same standard to an adult and as a child? And he says, no, here's the difference. It may be true that I, an adult, acquired a trait, a, a feature of my personality or character that I now value uh, from somebody else. They just instilled it in me. And he says, let's imagine an evil scientist. This is on, on page 127. Let's imagine an evil scientist puts this trait in me. I can make that trait my own so that it is, it is really me. How do I do this? I have to have a certain level of self-awareness. I can recognize, I have to be able to look inside myself and say, hey, I have that trait. I got it from somewhere else. I now accept it. I now welcome it into the club of traits that make up me. Uh, and having done that, it becomes mine. So adults can do that. Children cannot. There are another couple of ways adults can do it. Even if I misconceive it, he gives the example of someone who, who has a trait that they misidentify as them being charming when in fact they're not charming, but still they're, they, they think that this feature of themselves, their sarcastic sense of humor perhaps, makes them charming, and therefore they value that feature of themselves when in fact they shouldn't. Uh, that's still, that's enough to make that really a feature of them. So in, in acting from that uh, feature of themselves, they are being autonomous. Whereas in acting from a feature that you just acquired from someone else without making it your own, you are not being autonomous because it's not really your feature. So the mere fact that you initially acquired a trait from somebody else, even an evil scientist brainwashing it into you, doesn't mean that you can't act from it later autonomously, so long as you have gone through a process of making that trait your own in the meanwhile. And the reason why adults can do that, whereas children can't, is because children uh, don't have a sense of self, the sense of self necessary. They can't be above themselves and say, hey, I have this trait. And they don't have a knowledge of causes of traits and so on. So the process 
that you need to go through to make a trait that has been instilled in you by someone else your own, part of your own personality, so that in acting from it you are acting autonomously. That process requires skills and uh, capacities that a child doesn't have. So, we are right to doubt that Jessica Dubroff's desire to fly round across the United States is, an, is a real expression of her true self that we would be unjustifiably paternalistic in preventing. Whew. I hope that made sense. Um, now, this is true of young children, but what about adolescents? Adolescents, like adults, are capable of the process whereby you make a trait your own. So, this justifica the justification of paternalism that allows us to say you can prevent Jessica from flying across the world without being unjustifiably paternalistic, um, we can't make that argument for adolescents. So in section five, he, he considers a different argument that we can make for adolescents. I don't know about you, but I find this argument a little dubious, but still, here it is. He says, um, we have an obligation, even to adolescents, to help them become autonomous, to help them to become their own person. Now, this is most obvious in cases of adolescents who ha are in some sense wounded, like the adolescent alone described by Bluestein and, Bluestein and Moreno on in, in page 134. These are people who have self-doubt, they don't believe in themselves, they're fearful, they, they have no sense of self-worth. Obviously, if we're their parents, we have a duty to bolster them up. Now, part of what it takes to bolster them up is to allow them to make choices for themselves. So, when do we step in and not make them make choices? So, um, the, uh, has it, have you seen the movie Monsters University? In Monsters University, there's, uh, there's a competition called the Scare Games. And at one moment in the Scare Games, one of the challenges that the monsters have to go through is they have to distinguish between children who can be scared and adolescents who you mustn't try and scare because they won't scare and they'll catch you. Uh, and it's like those scenes when tr police are being trained and you, you, you have uh, little things pop up that are obviously villains that you've got to shoot and then things pop up that are obviously civilians that you mustn't shoot. So you have things pop up that are obviously children and then things pop up that are obviously ad adolescents. And one of the in, the ones that pops up is an adolescent girl, and she says, "But Daddy, I love him." Uh, and this is supposed to be an indication of an adolescent. And this is obviously uh, like um, the the girl at the beginning of this chapter who wants to run off with her boyfriend. Uh, she says, "But Daddy, I love him," uh, and she runs off with him. Amy Lynn Hagen. Um, now, we have a duty to instill self-worth in, in our adolescents. Should we quash their choices when we think they're bad, bad ones? Isn't that exactly the wrong thing to do? Isn't this unjustifiable paternalism? Here's Richard's suggestion. Yes, we have an obligation to help raise our child, but when someone has an obligation to do something, other people have an obligation not to prevent them fulfilling that obligation. Does that make sense? When I, I suppose I have an obligation to do something, you, and you know that I have an obligation to do something, you have an ancillary obligation not to prevent me carrying out my obligation. I have an obligation, let's say, to raise my adolescent. The adolescent themselves has an obligation not to prevent me. Um, so, this requires them respecting my authority, because I say, I'm doing this for your good, it's my duty to do this, I have to do this, I wouldn't do this to you if you were a stranger, I wouldn't do this to you if you were another adult, I don't want to have to do this, but I'm doing this because I have an obligation to raise you, I believe, 
that I know this is better for you. Help me out here. Um, I'll summarize the quote on page 137. What would have deserved Rick's respect as an expression of autonomy if it was chosen by an adult, going off with the boyfriend, might not deserve the same respect in an adolescent because the parents haven't yet completed their obligation to help the adolescent become the kind of adult the larger society has a right for him or her to be. That's part of the thing. My obligation to raise my kid isn't just an obligation to the kid, it's an obligation to society as a whole. Every, every parent has a duty to ensure that their kid isn't a burden on society. And that's part of the reason that the state is justified in stepping in in cases where parents are raising psychotic kids or raising criminal kids because they're violating their duty to the state. Um, so the argument there is that uh, you can be, it's not paternalism because paternalism is to do something, an unjustifiable restriction of someone's autonomy. But if you're fulfilling an obligation or if you're making someone fulfill an obligation, it can't be an unjustifiable restriction of autonomy. So if I as the parent am making my kid do something, making my kid fulfill their obligation to help me raise them, then I can't be violating their autonomy because I'm making them do something they've got to do anyway. Pretty convoluted argument. That's his argument for adolescence. So he has separate arguments justifying paternalism uh, or justifying, you know, restricting the autonomy of young children. His argument there is that it's not really restricting their autonomy because autonomy is, is acting from your true self but kids don't yet have a true self because the, the traits they have have been instilled in them by their parents or other people without their control. And it's not really their true self until they go through a process of making those traits their own. And only an adult or, or, or only an older, uh, at least teenager, has the faculties to do that. All right, so that's the argument for um, not... Uh, respecting the autonomy of young children, at least in lots of ways. And here's a case that Richards never considers that is uh, relevant to the now. Quite young kids are coming out as trans these days. And the question is, to what extent do we respect a child's desire to be treated as other than we would label them according to the biological uh, equipment. You know, so something that, you know, has a pe uh, a child who has a penis and testicles says, I'm a girl. At what point do we decide that we should respect that? I think that's a serious and important question. And maybe that's a good test for Richard's view that he doesn't consider because they're not obvious that they're not wanting to fly across the continental United States. They're not, you know, putting themselves at lethal harm. We may think they're putting themselves in harm of ridicule, but that's not their fault. That's like the case of uh, Aboriginal parents. You don't remove a child from a Native American family or an Aboriginal family just because there's racism around and if they speak fun, they speak differently than the majority, they'll be hampered. That's not a reason to remove a child from their parents. Um, and, and what about, or, or that's not a, a reason, well, is it a reason to restrict the child's autonomy? I think that's an interesting question. Anyway, if you again, I've rambled on. There was a lot in this section. I'm sure that nobody is watching still at this point, but if you are, good for you. And remember also that the last section of this chapter uh, is also a summing up. So the section six on page 138 summarizes everything that he's gone through, obviously very briefly. Hope you enjoy the movies. Uh, there are some great movies. There are some movies that you will remember. These are not movies that you can watch and forget about unless you have a heart of stone. 
And if you have a heart of stone, maybe your children should be removed from you because you lack, you have a serious defect in concern. So bear that in mind.